Sego se wagwego, Jennifer Yanyats, Gatnega Hagani e Tandanega, Dotno, Six Nations, Nita Wagenu. So, hello. Um, I just introduced myself um, and named the, the Mohawk Nation, the people of the Flint. Um, and also um, uh, stated that I'm a mother of two boys. So, in honor of Haudenosaunee ways of contextualizing knowledge, um, I always begin uh, my presentations as well as um, my writing um, in this in this manner. And I think that it's really important, and much like Jamie was saying, to acknowledge um, those scholars that have paved the way. Um, before us within academic institutions. And so part of my traditional introduction is honoring them as well as the ancestors that I believe guide me on my academic journey. <clears throat> I also wanted to acknowledge, um, like Jamie mentioned, that I am new to this territory. So I wanted to acknowledge um, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, OG Cree, sorry, Dakota, Dene, and that this is Metis um, homeland. <clears throat> I woke up this morning with a very, very sore throat, um, so I apologize. I'll try to um, speak as loud as I can, but I apologize um, <clears throat> for that. So today I'll be talking a lot about my doctoral research, um, which was titled Journeying Toward a Praxis of Indigenous Maternal Pedagogy, Lessons from Our Sweetgrass Baskets. Um, and towards the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll kind of give a sense of where that title, Our Sweet Grass Baskets, um, came from. But I'd like to share a bit about the importance of honoring um, my own cultural identity in the work that I do. Um, so this, being a student in a mainstream doctoral education program, um, came as a significant challenge. Um, it was one where I felt that I was continually pushing um, the boundaries and, and urging, um, urging the program to kind of indigenize, become indigenized and be a welcoming space for indigenous students in that program. Um, and so it was important that that I was committed to going through the program as a de and experiencing that as a decolonizing and indigenizing journey. Um, so really being grounded and honoring my role as a Yonkwe Hongwe or Mohawk woman, so honoring that in the work that I do, honoring my role as a mother, um, and also as an indigenous scholar. And much like Jamie mentioned, that um, really humbly following this path that has been cleared for us already and hoping that my work can contributes to continuing to um, pave that pathway for students to come. Um, so I, I was really drawn to this um, quote from um, a Hawaiian indigenous scholar um, who writes about the importance of being indigenous and authentic and really honoring personal ties to research. He stated that your relationship to your research topic is your own. It springs from a lifetime of distinctiveness and uniqueness only you have history with. Be encouraged by this. Do not doubt your own capacity to scaffold complex and cultural ways in which to describe the world. Um, and this, this really resonated with me, as I mentioned. I had a lot of challenges. Um, so I worked through indigenous maternal pedagogy, but also indigenous maternal methodology right, within a mainstream doctoral program. Um, where we didn't have any indigenous scholars, um, any indigenous professors um, in that program to really seek guidance from. <clears throat> um, so I thought it would be important to really give a sense of what maternal pedagogies are. Um, so my understanding of maternal pedagogies um, actually stemmed from two courses that I, that I took. So I took an undergraduate course on um, mothering, and I took a graduate course on gendering educational histories. And so both of those courses used texts um, that were authored by Dr. Andrea O'Reilly, who is um, kind of the founder of um, maternal uh, maternal methodologies, and so she edited this book called Maternal Theory Essential Readings, and in this book she defines maternal pedagogies um, from three different perspectives, so motherhood as experience and role, motherhood as institution or ideology, and motherhood as identity and subjectivity. So within this reader, um, it covers a diversity within motherhood studies that is often omitted from motherhood theories. Um, so some examples of that would be indigenous ideologies of motherhood, 
queer mothering, the sociology of gender, radical parenting. Um, and this book also offers many chapters that challenge the essentialist notions of maternal pedagogies. Um, so one of the challenges with working with maternal pedagogy is that perception um, and kind of understanding maternal pedagogy is through a gender binary framework. And so that's not what maternal pedagogy is about. <clears throat> So maternal pedagogies in and outside of the classroom. Um, in this text, Bird and Green ask several um, important questions about how to bring maternal pedagogies into the classroom in a way that is open and accessible um, and that embraces the identities of all students. So they ask, are there maternal ways of constructing and transmitting knowledge? And if so, how do these vary according to factors such as race, class, gender, ethnicity, sexual identity, nationality, and or disability. What kinds of teacher-student relationships characterize the interactions of a given group of mothers and children they're rearing? And are these dynamics stable or do they change over time? And so again, their work continues to really challenge the essentializing notions of what motherhood means. And they do so by asking um, these important questions. Um, so considering teacher and students both engaged in knowledge construction, encouraging a learning process that is empowering for all, um, critiquing the capitalist, patriarchal, and heteronormative ways of understanding knowledge, practice um, encouraging students to name and combat oppression, and by offering a space for navigating a hostile environment that is not designed to encourage the success of all. Um, and so that was certainly my experience and the experience of many Indigenous um, learners, um, particularly those that participated in my research. <clears throat> so defining Indigenous maternal pedagogies, um, for me it was largely driven from the work of Dr. Mimi Lavelle Harvard um, and her mother, Jeanette Corbet Lavelle, as well as Dr. Kim Anderson. Um, so I have just images of five books there that have been authored through um, Demeter Press that I believe represent indigenous, or present indigenous maternal pedagogies. Um, and so again, this work presents the experiences of um, motherhood um, from an indigenous perspective, but it's so much more than that. So it could be um, state intervention in motherhood, um, thinking about choice, um, from an indigenous perspective, choice to become a mother or to mother, um, the way the state has controlled that, as I mentioned, but as well as violence against indigenous women and girls. <clears throat> um, and there's also space within this, of course, for um, trans and two-spirited. Um, and so I, I place this quotation here from Kim Anderson and Mimi Lavelle Harvard. I'll just read it out. After centuries of persecution and oppression, the simple fact that we are still here at the heart of our families, communities, and nations signifies the strength of our resistance. Whether this resistance has been overt as our sisters engage in constitutional challenges or human rights demonstrations, <clears throat> or covert as we silently reconnect with the land and teach our children the ways of our ancestors, our efforts have ensured the continued survival of our people. And so for me, understandings of indigenous maternal pedagogy um, must also be understood within uh, the context of structural violence against um, indigenous women, girls, transgendered and two-spirited. Indigenous maternal pedagogies connects maternal pedagogies with women-centered indigenous epistemologies that embrace the whole students within educational contexts as a way to promote the cultural identity development of students, encourage ethical dialogue between indigenous and non-indigenous learners, foster agency, advocacy, and activism through indigenous women-centered curriculum, and move beyond patriarchal and essentialist notions of the word maternal. Um, and it also embraces non-biological understandings of mothering. And so I'm going to talk about the ways in which I have brought this into the classroom, um, the ways I enact this theory, um, or this pedagogical approach in my classrooms. And so um, three of the classes that I taught that were part of this study um, were um, two Indigenous women's literature courses. So one was part of a program called the Gadayaman Program, 
which was a first year transition program. Um, and the other two were Indigenous Studies electives offered at Brock University. Sorry, and just, I don't know if I mentioned the three courses. So two were Indigenous literature courses, Indigenous women's literature courses, um, and one was an Indigenous mothering course. And so those courses um, um, were the courses where my participants uh, um, came from, but since then I have taught Indigenous Studies courses and now I'm at the University of Manitoba and I'm teaching um, Indigenous Perspectives courses to teacher candidates. So I'm finding new ways to enact this pedagogical approach um, largely to not, I, I largely have a class now where I only have one Indigenous student, right? So largely to non-Indigenous students, whereas um, in the courses, three previous courses that I mentioned, I was teaching um, classes that were predominantly um, uh, comprised of Indigenous students. <clears throat> so some of the theoretical underpinnings of Indigenous maternal pedagogy, um, I draw on the work of Alex Wilson, and she describes the rippling effect of cultural identity as it promotes to well-being. Um, and so her theory here is foundational to my research. And, um, I, I really found evidence of that um, from the participant narratives as well. Um, so according to her theory, well-being ripples from self to family to community and to nation, and then back um, from nation to community to family to self. Right? So um, for a healthy nation, we must have healthy um, beings, um, but we need a healthy nation to also nurture those healthy beings. Marlene Pomerick employed a resiliency framework and draws attention to the internal resources, so self-efficacy and internal drive to understand the successes of Indigenous women. Um, and so resiliency is a huge um, theory that um, I find within Indigenous women's literature as well as within the narratives of my participants. Greenwood and Delu emphasize the importance of fostering indigeneity as a capacity building initiative and Mimi Laval Harvard positioned Aboriginal women's academic achievement as transformational resistance that stems from an awareness of social inequities and a belief in education um, as a vehicle of social change. So in her work, she also talks about the challenges that Indigenous women face in mainstream education, but kind of um, shapes that within the context of this community belief in education as a vehicle for social change, and that really speaks to the need to decolonize and indigenize um, in university landscapes. <clears throat> and so just to note, you'll notice that I use words like Aboriginal and Indigenous interchangeably. Um, I'm usually, um, so when I say the word Aboriginal within this context, I'm drawing on the author's um, use of the word in their research. Um, but. I do prefer to use the term indigenous kind of to just encompass all experiences. I'm going to talk about three of the theoretical frameworks um, that I enact um, um, as a way of delivering indigenous maternal pedagogies within the classroom. Um, I am covering a lot of material, so I'm just kind of going to brush over these, uh, but I think it's important. Um, to really clarify what I mean by the three of them. So maternal essence largely um, is something that I found within Indigenous women's literature, but also within um, the pilot study, uh, which affirmed my understanding of maternal essence and then the narratives of the women in my research. And so I describe maternal essence as a spiritual and physical legacy that promotes strength and resilience. And I'll talk more about that in the following slide. Um, home place, so I extend the theory of home place by Bell Hooks. Um, a critical race theorist in the United States who defines home place as a space for resistance and renewal, and I apply that to indigenous experiences of home place. And then finally, I draw on Kim Anderson's cultural identity theory, where she proposes that indigenous women engage in a process of resisting, reclaiming, constructing, and acting as they come to a recognition of being. And again, this was another foundational um, theory within my research where a lot of the women talked about their own process of coming to a recognition of being <clears throat> throughout the courses. So maternal essence is expressed by indigenous authors in many ways, um, including a maternal energy that guides them throughout their life journey, the inspiration for their writing, 
And I find a lot of the literature also focuses on maternal um, figures that have a in significant influential role on characters. So for example, the role of Cheechum in Maria Campbell's Half-Breed. And so just an example of uh, the way I see or sorry, maternal essence um, within indigenous women's literature, I have just a segment of a quotation from Lee Miracle's book, Daughters Are Forever. Um, so in her opening chapter, um, she stated that women were born awake. In their bodies lived the memories of their star nation mother's moment with West Wind. In their blood coursed traces of old agreements. These traces nagged them until story awakened them. Through story, each generation of women schooled the next to solve crises, to enter into relationship with others, eyes wide open and hearts optimistic. Through these stories, the women learned to search the world for responses. They emulated the beings around them and dotums were born. That's kind of like the first half of a very long quotation um, that I actually use in my literature courses. Um, and I get the students to kind of work, piece through that and, and think of some of the, um, some of the um, messages and, and, and things that they can find within that quotation um, and sort of relate that um, to contemporary realities that we're facing today. So at the end of the second half of this quotation, which I don't have on there, she ends by saying that Turtle Island women had no reason to fear other human beings. Right? So I think that, that in that piece there, she's making very um, profound statements about the contemporary realities that um, indigenous women and communities are facing today. Bell Hook's theory of home place um, is one where she talks about the safe space for renewal and self-recovery. Um, but also a space of resistance. And so she's really shaping this theory within the context um, of black women in the United States uh, who are resisting the racism, um, uh, what she refers to as white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, so what is happening outside of the homes, um, that inside of the homes is a safe space to resist that. But she also talks about um, uh, times where women are leaving their homes, so black women leaving the homes, she um, presents us within the context of slavery to work in the homes of other people um, and only have, say, three to four hours in the middle of the night where they're holding their own um, baby or their own child, and that's the only way that they have been able to provide this sense of home place for their child. And so I've taken that theory, and again, I've just very quickly brushed over it, um, but I, um, so I expand on this in the classroom, but this is one of the theories that I have taken to present an indigenous theory of home place. Oops. And so I get students to kind of think about, okay, well, what does home mean? And, and what does home mean to you? Um, what does home feel like? What qualities characterize home? And how has home or home place been disrupted for indigenous peoples? And so if we think about children being physically removed from the home um, and placed in residential schools or non-indigenous homes or detention centers, um, how have indigenous families been able to provide this sense of home place, right? So it's significantly, significantly been disrupted. Um, and so I get students, and this is where that activism, um, advocacy, and agency piece comes in. So I get students to really think about how they can create change by coming aware of these um, realities that indigenous families are still facing today. And then again, um, Kim Anderson's theory of identity formation. So she presents this theory within the context of Native women coming to this um, process of recognition of being. Um, so resisting all of the stereotypes that Indigenous women have faced. Um, and again, this can be applied to all Indigenous people, or it can be in the classroom, I apply it to all students in different ways. But within the context of Kim Anderson's theory, she's applied this to um, Indigenous women specifically. So moving beyond on that resist to reclaim. So kind of like dusting off all of that colonial debris and reclaiming um, what indigenous womanhood meant, what indigenous womanhood is, um, with all of those messages and, and all of those sort of things that um, have been part of the resist phase removed. And then construct. Um, so a sh construct is really where am I going? Um, now that I have reclaimed this identity, um, where am I going and how do I carry this with me within contemporary context? Um, 
And so I think indigenous women's literature definitely is an example of that construct phase because um, in many ways the oral tradition is now being passed on within the written um, way so that is it can become accessible to more people. Um, and so um, within the context of the indigenous women's literature course that I teach, I use this kind of windows and mirrors theory, but a lot of people see that reflection of themselves, their families, their cultural identities within um, indigenous women's literature, which can become a source of empowerment. And then act, so acting on uh, responsibilities moving forward, acting on responsibilities in terms of representing um, these um, these empowered identities. And so I draw on these three frameworks that I mentioned, so maternal essence, home place, um, and cultural identity theory to help students understand um, the contemporary realities through a history of structural violence. Um, and so they learn about things um, like the Indian Act in Section 12.1b, the eugenics movement and the forced sterilization of indigenous women, the past system, um, residential school system, the 60 scoop, recent cases of forced sterilization, as well as contemporary discrimination against indigenous children. So I'm not going to get into more detail about these now, but just to give a sense of some of the things that um, students um, work through throughout the courses. <clears throat> um, and so I draw on this, these words here from Maria Campbell, and with Maria Campbell's work, a lot of this understanding of maternal essence comes through. Um, so, of course, she's the author of um, the book Half Breed. She was also, so these words come from her keynote address at the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Conference in 2008. And she stated that patriarchy and misogyny are so ingrained in our society that they are normal and our silence makes them normal. Um, and so I'm, in a, I'm not sure if these links are going to work, but just to give a sense of some of the examples that I would share in the classroom to showcase um, the ongoing structural violence that has become accepted within society. This restaurant, downtown, or downtown Toronto on Young Street, um, several years ago was serving these two hamburger items. Um, so you could order a hamburger called the Half Breed, or you could er order a hamburger called the Dirty Drunken Half Breed. Um, and so you can see some of the other titles for their names of their hamburgers there. But basically, they claimed that they did not think that um, these terms were offensive. And so they did change their menu. And so this is the menu as it exists today from their, their current website. Um, and so they no longer serve those two hamburgers, but they do still serve the misunderstood breed and the dirty, drunken, and misunderstood. Another example, um, so 2015 in Bathurst, New Brunswick, during a cultural festival, these murals were um, painted on storefront windows. So I'm not sure how well you can see the images, but um, so they're two women there that are, that are tied up. Um, and then here we have a priest looking down on what would appear to be indigenous children. Um, and so this was during a cultural festival um, in Bathurst, New Brunswick in 2015, so only a couple years ago. And so um, the response to this was that while communities are pushing for a national public inquiry into indigenous women and girls, that this was acceptable. Um, and so again, the response was that we are sorry, we had no idea that these images were painful and would be upsetting. Many of you might be familiar with uh, the fashion label D Squared um, and their, their fashion line entitled D Squa um, for their fashion collection. And so again, of course, um, there has been some response from indigenous community. Um, and so again, um, this was uh, the D Squared did get the rights to do the um, fashion designing for the Olympics. And so again, more outrage with how can we have um, these designers do something when they've, you know. I think there was a somewhat insincere public apology. Um, but again, these are very, very recent examples um, of the way that we see this patriarchy and misogyny accepted within our society. And so um, you know, when we think about these things like the national public um, inquiry into missing and murdered, indigenous women, girls, uh, trans and two-spirited people, you have to, you know, 
how can we not be making these connections um, to these things that have become accepted and normalized throughout many sectors of society? So, of course, this is the fashion industry, the cultural festival, art, um, and you know, a restaurant. <clears throat> Um, so in terms of that, bringing it back to Indigenous maternal pedagogy um, and this notion of maternal essence, um, this is the cover of uh, Forever Loved, Exposing the Hidden Crisis of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls in Canada. Um, and this was done by Alyssa General. And so um, the title of this piece is Thunder Destroys the Horned Serpent. And so what she's doing is um, she's, she draws on the Haudenosaunee legend <clears throat> of Thunder Woman, and that the horned serpent represents um, a sign of danger, kind of like this, this white supremacist capitalist patriarchy um, that is bringing harm to indigenous women. So I can't share that story as eloquently as, as she can, but um, that's basically bringing through Haudenosaunee narratives, um, bringing empowerment to indigenous women that we can um, destroy these things that um, are a source of violence. So in terms of finding agency, advocacy, and activism, and becoming empowered participants, um, I, I wanted to highlight two stories of women um, that had um, completed the Gudayman program, which again was this transition program, and then went on to complete um, all three of the courses that I mentioned, so the two Indigenous Women's Literature course and the Mothering course. Um, and so one of the women, women, Jessica, her daughter actually took the program as well. Um, so just to give a sense of uh, Jessica, she has five children um, and I think four grandchildren now. Um, and so when she started this program in 2012, when she went through the Diamond program, she describes herself as this very shy woman that um, she was just learning about who she was um, as an Anishinaabe woman, um, learning about um, her own, you know, it was a journey for her, right? So learning what her clan was, making connections with her family, um, becoming comfortable, participating in indigenous community, um, to finding her voice. And so she um, has moved beyond that sense of not being able to speak at all to finding her voice, but also um, she has coordinated um, events on um, both how to become an ally and missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, she published a chapter um, in the Forever Loved, Exposing the Hidden Crisis book. Um, and she's also now um, one of the board members on sort of the local chapter of the Native Women's Association um, uh, in the Niagara region. And so um, her trans formative story, I think, really speaks to um, finding a place within um, education um, and, and the empowerment that comes with that. And then Sabrina is another woman, and she described her experience as one of coming home to spirit um, and to indigenous knowledge, and one where she has been moved to bring holistic back to her community. Um, and so Sabrina was instrumental in actually um, um, getting women together um, and so been in instrumental in um, the creation of the Niagara Indigenous Women's Drum Group. And so they meet every Wednesday. In total, there's about 50 women, probably about 20 that meet consistently. Um, and they've been singing all over. Um, and so we had the celebration of nations in the Niagara community in September. And so they were on stage to sing for that um, alongside you know, Sante Smith and Buffy St. Marie. Um, and they were also, so they are also at kind of local um, advocacy or activism events such as um, supporting the Haudenosaunee deer hunters, There's huge protest that's actually happening right now. It happens twice a year. Um, and so they're, they're singing to support the deer hunters. Um, they were also in Toronto singing um, during the, the 60s scoop. Um, 60 Scoop Survivor case, so they were there at the courthouse singing for them. So they kind of been traveling all over singing. So just to give a sense, and, and she really, um, in Sabrina's words, she really credits that to um, kind of having this push to become a reconnected um, with her culture and with her identity. And I um, feel that education um, can be a place. It's not the only place, of course, for that to be done, but it needs to be a place, right? That there needs to be these indigenous spaces that are empowering um, for all learners. And so moving forward with my research, um, 
I'm now, as I mentioned, teaching uh, teacher candidates, so I predominantly have non-Indigenous students now, which has kind of, I'm working through different ways that I'm shaping the curriculum. Um, um, but, so it's working towards kind of enacting Indigenous maternal pedagogy um, for non-Indigenous learners as well, so that they can find um, valuable strategies that they will bring into their classrooms um, as they move forward. So. Now I go and um, thank you very much for listening.